Joe, we're back at Newport Beach with episode 20 of season two called The OC Confidential, or should have been called The OC Cabfidential, because it's also the Death Cab for Cutie episode. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't even... <laughs> you said that it was gonna be a bad pun and to be generous with my laughter, and I couldn't even bring myself to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, yeah, home run, Kelly here again. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, that was not an indictment on you. It was just an indictment. Oh, no, that's so funny. No, that couldn't. Have- that was perfect. Um, yeah, that joke was a death cap. We are here. Uh, my first note. Just says Marissa is the source of everyone's problems. Um, and sure enough, Marissa, where we left off, Trey was arrested because Marissa threw a big ass party. Somebody OD'd, ended up in the pool. Marissa said, I was the one that gave, or Marissa was getting arrested. Trey says, No, I'm the one who sold the ecstasy. This leads to Trey assumedly losing his house briefly and having to move back into the pool house to be under Sandy's care while they try to figure this out, right? While all of this is happening, uh, it's decided that the rest of the core four are going to solve the mystery of who brought ecstasy to Marissa's party and, and thus clear Trey's name. This also happens to be going on while Zach and Seth are continuing their comic book stuff. And like, I wrote a couple notes about this. Okay. First off the sub, this whole subplot's dumb as hell. It's just Ah. a stupid fucking subplot. I hate it. It's not doing any favors for summer either because it's also just making her seem like super unsupportive of her boyfriend's dream coming true. Like, at all like it's a dumb dream and it's a dumb comic book but like you know if i was dating somebody and like my dumb podcast was being looked at by like headgum or like some major network and they were just like if i hear one more word about how your podcast is being looked at by this me i'd be like like this is everything i've ever dreamed of like it's such a it does her and Joey said that when he was on the show as well, but like really does her character no favors uh, throughout this entire subplot, which is a bummer because summer is, as we've discussed, once you get past the first like 10 episodes, the most likable person in Newport Beach <laughs> by a very wide margin. Uh, absolutely um, huge margin. Yes. Like it'd be di- like, I don't understand why she could be like, I don't want to hear about this because of, read you know what i mean like because cohen was being a scumbag but she's been like unsupportive of this comic since before reed came into the picture so like yeah not great carter meanwhile is trying to convince kirsten to go wine tasting with him like there's just a lot that's going on and nothing that's necessarily great so i wrote down carter's trying to get kirsten to go wine tasting with him zach seems to be trying to sabotage the relationship between seth and summer which i'm going to get back to in a second and caleb is definitely divorcing julie at this point yeah um he's not even being small so, about it no so it's like there's all of this stuff that's happening and like with the zach trying to sabotage seth and summer I'm of two minds of it. It does feel a little bit like they are trying to make Zach more sinister than he's ever been before. But the flip side is like Zach is literally only weaponizing Seth Cohen's own instincts and attitude. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like he's not putting Seth in any situation where Seth is looking bad by accident. He is just no letting Seth dive bomb his own relationship by not being able to like parse out business with Reed and like actual love with summer. And like, you know, maybe he deserves to get summer at this point in time. Like it's, it's very goofy. It's very weird. It's very dumb. Um, but like, then they end up going to, of course, death cab for cutie while all of this craziness is happening. They end up, playing at the bait shop 
Uh, no sign of the woman who handles the booking at the bait shop this week. No, whoever whoever <laughs> took over for Alex. <laughs> uh, I do have the line written down. Summer shows up at the Death Cab concert, and Seth is taking too long to get to the show because they're having their brainstorming session. And she says, it's one thing to blow me off, but to blow off Death Cab. <laughs> like, <laughs> And then she has possibly my favorite summer line of all time because she's not in on the trying to find the drug dealer subplot yet. Yeah. So Marissa's trying to get someone to sell her Coke so she can find the dealer. And Summer very sincerely goes, Marissa Cooper, are you doing Coke? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, it's just... It, 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 sorry. I just... I I was recently in a situation where somebody like very earnestly asked if anyone at the table had coke <laughs> and i was like i was so taken aback by it i was like what <laughs> it's like sir this is a denny's <laughs> yeah just wandering around with <laughs> ohms i heard i heard someone ask for me um so i realize that my notes are very slim in here and i do notice that my last note here says this episode has made me angrier and angrier the more that i've watched it um, I hate it. This episode, Joe, this might be one of my least favorite episodes of the OC. All of the subplots are stupid. Um, the Kirsten Carter plot is so dumb. It's so long. It's so boring. It's so unnecessary. If there is one thing that I hate it throughout all of season two, it is that the entirety of season two has been a Sandy Kirsten marriage in crisis season for no reasonable route like like it's just so forced and obnoxious and dumb um but that pales in comparison to how much i hate this comic book subplot like this stupid comic is getting all of this praise in the world of the show like i refuse to believe that atomic country is going to be this massive book atomic it is County. a comic yeah it's a comic written by a nerdy high schooler with no creativity. Like, everything about it sucks. The party that they're at sucks. Like, Summer overacting at the party sucks. Like, all of this is a nightmare. It's such a waste of Death Cab, who's a band I genuinely have liked for a long time. And this is their big appearance on the show? Is, like, this bullshit? Like... It's someone who, like, we've known about since season one, right? Yeah. Like, I, 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 like, it's been, it's been canonical. Like, it's one of the, like, it's in the, it's in the starter pack, right? Like, it's in the yes. Seth Cohen starter pack. So this, it, it, it just makes, it does a complete disservice <laughs> to how good the band, especially because, like, the way that they used Beck's music in the Beck episode was pretty great. So, like, yes, to see them kind of biff it so. on this one with a band that already is so connected to the DNA of the show is is very disappointing. It's, it's a band that, to this day, people still connect with the show. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know shit about the OC, and I knew that Seth Cohen's favorite band was Death Cab for Cutie. Yeah. Like, it was, it was probably the biggest thing that expanded outside of the pop culture of it. And also, like, almost nothing happens in this episode. Like, mm -hmm. like stuff happens, but nothing of substance. The biggest, the biggest thing that happens in this episode, I would say, is that Sandy succeeds in getting Trey off, like, gets mm -hmm. the charges dropped, and then you find out that he's fucking around with the girl who overdosed in the first place still. Like, yeah. that's it. Because, like, the Kirsten Carter stuff isn't going to fucking matter in two more weeks. Yeah. <laughs> like, like none of it's gonna matter. Like, okay, they got drunk, they shared a single kiss, and then she fucked off back home in a ride share. Like, I have a feeling that that kiss never gets brought up again. It is a completely forgotten thing, and that Carter just vanishes from our collective memories uh, by the by next week's episode. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. just like it's also inconsequential. I already feel like Reed is just ready to fucking dissipate out of the world again. Like Zach, I don't know how much more time Zach has because they're they're trying to make Zach a heel 
And like the only heelish thing he did was that smirk to Seth as he left with Summer. But like Summer had every reason to be like, I'm sick of this party. Zach, take me home. Like, yeah. like I said, he didn't. Zach hasn't done anything that wasn't just weaponizing Seth Cohen's own bad judgment. Yeah. Which <laughs> like, is also kind of like the best revenge, right? Like, because it's yeah. somebody who you know is you know cannot help themselves and cannot go against their nature and you're just kind of sitting back and watching him uh watching him crumble and watching him make the mistakes that you know he's going to make Uh, yeah it's 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 kind of beautiful um again i just i do love michael cassidy so (laughs) he's great i do love seeing him like play that nuance a little bit no he's fantastic i mean everything I, I like. I am very Prozac. <laughs> I didn't mean for that to sound that. I see what you uh, did yes, there. Yes, I am a fan of Zach. Ninety One Donkey Lane is a magical apartment complex that contains immense power but lacks intelligent inhabitants. What is happening? I'm getting texts. Why are we getting a lot of texts? People found out what we did. Oh, dividing Mike Myers into an infinite amount of tiny Mike Myers. Listen to 91 Donkey Lane for free on Spotify or your favorite podcasting app. More at 91donkeylane.com. See you there, you donkeys. Joe, let's just get into it. What was your favorite Death Cab song in this episode? Because the only music we get in this episode is Death Cab, title and registration, Death Cab, the sound of settling, Death Cab, a movie script ending, and then Block Party shows up with the song Positive Tension when Marissa and Ryan are searching for the drug dealer. I I, I hate to say it, but like they all kind of blend together. I'm not a Death Cab fan. Yeah. So it's just like, I mean, flip a coin, toss a die like it all works the way it's supposed to work but like again it's a little wah wah for me so i'm just not <laughs> i'm not i'm just I was gonna say title and invested. registration for both of us <laughs> you know my... we both agreed it was title and registration <laughs> yes yeah i was gonna say it's uh california by phantom planet <laughs> there we go uh joe pop culture man what what is something that you have been just enjoying diving into um you know, it's, I mentioned this, I think I mentioned this already. So let me actually, um, let me actually tell you, and then you can decide whether or not I need to cut this because it's, you know, a whole thing. If it's Matt Rogers, yes, you have. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole album is out now. So the album is out now. Yeah. Your previous thing was you were, t- so funny thing. We'll, we'll tie this back to something else tied to Geekscape. I get a text message out of nowhere from Kathleen of my favorite episode of and binge town TV. And all uh-huh. it is, is a link to Matt Rogers's album on Spotify. <laughs> and it just says you of all people will love this album. And I was like, funny, you should say that because <laughs> Joe has been very vocal also of how much I will love this album. Yes. I will listen to this album before the holiday is over. Okay. But we've already established that you will be doing an episode of Christmas 365 about that album. So I'm intentionally holding off until we're able to like lock down yeah. when we're going to record that episode. So everything is fresh in my head when we talk about it. Yeah. But it will get listened to before, before I'm opening presents uh, and drinking some hot cocoa by a fireplace and a beautiful tree. Well, wonderful. But I'm going to say the whole album. So this is still my thing. Leave this in, yeah. Matt. Um, Matt Rogers' whole I'm album. I'm leaving all of it in. I'm leaving it all yeah, in, leave it baby. All fucking in. Um, <laughs> Have you heard of Christmas, the Matt Rogers album? You've already heard me talk about it, but like, y'all, the whole album is fucking delightful. And like, it does that thing that comedy, musical comedy albums are doing now, where it is so, you can't even really tell, like, it's a musical comedy album. Like, it's not just a banjo talking about whatever, or just like, a, you know, a, a, a little guitar riff. It like has all this production. It's got, it's got production. It's got like actual pop beats and hooks. Like the a real pop producer, Leland, like it like produced the album, which is so fantastic. It's like I could hear this on the radio and be fine. Um, 
the the new songs that are on the album that he uh, hasn't done in his show previously that are just unique to uh, to this work are really great. And there's a the final song. Um, I don't need it to be Christmas. Um, is like just a really earnest Christmas song. Like if there's no comedy elements to it in the same way, there's no irony in the same way that the other there's other stuff in there. And so it's just so lovely as well to hear like a new Christmas song, but also it plays to it plays to every single <laughs> it plays to every single Christmas trope of Christmas music. It's got like, you know, jingle bells and like, you know, big swelling beats and like it's just it's just, it's all good. It's all good. And I can't wait to do it on Christmas 365. And depending on when we get to do it, I probably will have, because he's doing a tour right now of his album. And so I'm doing the, uh, I'm going to watch it like five rows from, <laughs> five rows from the stage in the center uh, to uh, here in LA soon. So I'm looking forward to that. I love that. I, um, I love what you said about the big production because I do think that in this day and age, like musical comedy has really taken that turn, right? Like the thing that made Lonely Island work so well was that if you weren't really paying attention to the lyrics, it was not distinguishable from what was actually happen happening yeah. in hip hop at that point. And I think that that's like the way that musical comedy has to survive now is you have to be willing to put in the money into it and like really go over the top because like the days of a guy with a guitar, just singing silly songs is so like over. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just, that's not no. And that's coming from a guy who, when he was living in LA was doing guy with a guitar material. Like I couldn't, if I wanted to, I would need to at least have a backup band at, at a minimum yeah. to do the songs that were, that I was doing way back when. Um, Joe, I'm not going to talk about music, but I am going to talk about something near and dear to my heart, which is shark movies, because Shudder dropped an unbelievable documentary uh, called Shark Exploitation this year Ooh. that I've watched three times. And it is a film about uh, basically from Jaws on this boom that happened in the 70s with all of these like shark or Jaws adjacent movies like Grizzly and Alligator. And then it goes into the modern shark movie and how things shift it suddenly. And now you're getting like Sharknado and Sharks of the Corn and like all of these like ridiculous like $10 shark parody films. Um, but what I thought was really, really interesting is like they're interviewing people who are horror movie fans. They're interviewing people who love bad movies. They're interviewing the directors of some of these movies. But on top of all of that, they're also interviewing uh, shark experts oh, to talk about like the effects that these movies had on the shark ecosystem and like the negative side of this stuff. And they don't shy away from talking about like the movies from the 70s where they would just kill a shark on screen without a care in the world for it to be like good footage for their movie. Um, so it's it's a really interesting watch. It's a brisk like 100 minutes. You know what I mean? Like oh, it is yes. not these like two, three hour marathon documentaries that we get. Like it is it is concise. It has a focus and it it's great. I, I absolutely love it. I've been recommending it to any of my uh, friends who enjoy documentaries about like specific times in horror i think this is one of the best uh films that we've gotten like this in a long long time um so i wanted to end with one of the best things i've seen in a long long time on one of the worst episodes <laughs> of the oc i've seen in a long long time but i'm reminded that last week i said that the fun was no longer happening until the end of this season completely forgetting what next week's episode is which is definitely I mean, there's some dark parts in there, but for the most part, that is a shut off your brain and have a good time episode. So we'll be back not in Newport Beach next week on the OC White People Problems.
You're listening to the Geekscape Network. 